Hello and welcome to the Deb Calvert channel on Bright Talk. I'm Deb Calvert and I want to start today by thanking you. Um, A lot of you come back month after month to this series that is for uh, people who are in HR or in management roles. And a lot of you are really good about coming back month after month, but also sharing and calling me and asking questions and posting ideas. And I really appreciate that. Uh, I also appreciate your reviews after each session, your questions that you ask during the live views. And I'm using all of that to put together some really interesting topics, I think, for 2020. And within about a week, we will be posting those and opening up registration for all of them in 2020 with a much heavier emphasis on uh, supervising and managing uh, and uh, continuing to support the folks in HR. So uh, thank you for, for being here. Today's topic, well, it is a topic that is one that, that most managers agree is constantly an issue because there's just, there's never, (laughs) never enough time. And we're not going to be reviewing uh, general or generic recommendations for managing your time. What we're going to be talking about, because, you know, you've you've probably mastered a lot of those already in previous roles, but we're going to focus more narrowly in on how managers can manage their time in your management role, how you can manage your time in ways that will make you more effective. Now, I'm going to start out by talking about some of the time stealers that managers encounter. Then I'll talk about a little different philosophy, if you will, for for allocating your time. And I'll give you three strategies that you can implement right away. We're going to spend most of our time, though, because there's a lot packed in here. We'll be spending the majority of our time on the one strategy out of those three, or out of any, uh, the one strategy that will give you more time for management-level work, plus will simultaneously develop people on your team so that you, long-term, you get even more time and more team effectiveness. And, well, that strategy, of course, is delegating, so we'll, we'll get to that before too long, but I will be giving you a little different take on it than you've probably heard before. So let me jump back just a moment. For those who might be new to this channel or new to Bright Talk, um, as I said, I'm I'm Deb Calvert, and you can see my background on screen there. I've I've worked in an HR role. I've worked in a number of management roles. I worked at a Fortune 500, and I've worked with many, many, many organizations over the past 14 years as a consultant and a researcher and a coach to executives in all different types of functions. I'd love it if we had a chance to connect um, outside of this webinar, so I put for you a link in the tab that says Attachments and Links, if you'll open that up. I've given you uh, a direct link to me on LinkedIn, and I hope that we will uh, continue to connect there. I post a lot of content and give away a lot of freebies. I also, there in the attachments, something else you'd probably like to know here at the beginning, uh, I've given you the slides from this presentation, just a, a PDF, so you've got a handout, and you're welcome to download that for your own use. As we go through the presentation today, I'll refer to a couple of other tools that I think will be of use for you, and all of this is, is just bonus content. Uh, that's one of the great things about Bright Talk is that they make it easy for me to share with you some additional things beyond the, the slides. As long as you're looking over there at the tabs, please notice that there's a tab where you can post questions to me. I always appreciate those. I'll try to weave in the answers seamlessly as we go, so don't feel like you have to wait till the end. If we run out of time and I don't get to all of your questions, well, then I'll I'll email you, and we'll make sure to to cover those um, outside of this as well. Okay. Okay. That's probably all we need logistically. One last thing, there is an orange button at the very bottom on the right-hand side, I believe, that says get live support now. If you have any technical difficulties during the live presentation, that's the button to go to. The folks at Bright Talk are incredible, and they'll give you what you need. Uh, I won't really be able to do anything besides refer you to them. So go, go directly to the source. Okay, now what you came for. Let, let's start out by talking about what may be the obvious, these are the most likely culprits 
that are cutting into your time, if you are a manager or if you do supervisory work, these are the, the types of things that probably encroach every day on the work that you'd like to be doing. And I've touched on some of these other topics in past webinars, so you may want to go back and, and look at the uh, archive here in this channel if, if you're looking for some additional information. I'll certainly be covering more of these going forward in 2020, so I encourage you to subscribe to the channel too. Um, in December, I'll be talking about assertiveness and influence, which has perhaps more overlap than, than you might think when it comes to some of those bullet points that um, aren't showing up in purple on screen today. So I recommend that you download the slides and you come back to this one later and do some self-assessment. Your goal, the purpose of doing that assessment, would be to tackle one time thief at a time. And you don't have to miraculously transform your day. What you'll be looking for are the small wins, the places where you can shave a little time. Because every minute that you get back into your work day, it adds up, especially when you're a manager and everything you do has a multiplying effect. Now the top three ones, the ones that are in purple, those are the ones that we're going to address here today in this little bit of time that we have together. And we're going to start by thinking about how you allocate your time, because that is the overarching theme. You could do anything with your time. You have questions that pop up probably every single day, and um, you'll want to take a look at, uh, at how you allocate your time. That would be the first place to start. Remember, if you have any technical issues, you want to go ahead and get live support now directly from Bright Talk. The questions field is best used to ask me questions about the topic because I just can't help you out with, with the technology piece. Okay, so how do you allocate your time? As a people leader, it may be considerably different from how you allocated your time as a frontline contributor. And yet nobody ever really talks about that shift. Nobody ever really talks about what should be different about the proportion of your time that you spend on, on different tasks now. So it, it, it bears mentioning. Now in some of our earliest webinars this year, the ones that, that were for managers, um, I, I introduced to you, if you've been there before with me, I introduced you to the notion of putting people first, before process, before procedures, before protocols, before any of the products that you might be responsible for, any of those processes, profits, anything. If you put people first, you have your best shot of achieving everything else. But to do that, you have to be two things. You have to be both a manager of work and a leader of people. It, it, it turns out, no surprise here, but the strongest people leaders consistently post the best work results. And you may recall, if you've been here before, discussions that we've had about employee engagement and how leadership behaviors significantly boost engagement levels. And that creates a domino effect that, uh, according to research, leads to improved retention of your top performers, also boosts in productivity levels and in customer satisfaction, and then both top line and bottom line revenue and profit growth. So we know that that part of the job, leading people, matters a lot. But when it comes to time management, most of us are evaluating the efficiency of our time spent by the volume of work that's processed or completed in a certain time period. And that's because, of course, I, mean, I get why that happens. It's because a manager's effectiveness is generally measured by the team's output. But you know, that, that's really short-term thinking. It, it's a trap, and it will keep you mired in time-stealing activities that erode employee engagement levels and prohibit you from achieving that domino effect of benefits that come when you are operating as a leader who engages people. 
And that's why I'm starting here. That's why we need to reframe the way we think about our own time allocation. Ideally, you'd be acquiring, uh, developing a philosophy of time management that liberates you to lead people and places the responsibility for work production back on the frontline employees who report to you. So to get there, to start that thought process and develop that philosophy, what you see on screen, these are three questions that are the people first way to allocate your time. With that first question, consider whether or not you're adding value in any activity that you spend time on. One clue, a warning sign that you're diminishing value rather than creating it is if you're doing the same work that you did in a non-management role. If you're doing the same work as your direct reports, you're actually holding the organization back. See, that's not your job. You're no longer a frontline contributor. You really do need to hand that work to the appropriate team members and begin adding value, much bigger value as a manager and leader. Second thing to think about, to think about how you're going to allocate your time effectively, is to begin every single day with a mission, a stated purpose, a focus to help someone else grow. And if you will measure each day's accomplishment for yourself by asking, who grew today and how did they grow? then you're going to do a much better job of leading people and managing work effectively because you're going to be getting daily incremental growth in the capacity of your team. And then finally, if you've never attended any of my webinars about coaching, I'll I'll tell you a lot more about what I'm going to say next in those webinars, so, so be sure and click back to those. But we know, research tells us that There are significant benefits, a lot of merits, to increasing your time spent on people development. So instead of thinking about what needs your attention, because that's always going to be task-focused and short-term, instead of thinking about what needs your attention, think instead about who needs your attention in order to grow and thrive and contribute more to the team's overall effectiveness. Now, this philosophy, this guiding principle about allocating your time as a people leader will help you to set priorities and do a better job of focusing on what really matters. So please keep that philosophy in mind. I'm going to give you the three specific time feeds that I teed up earlier and give you a few strategies to protect yourself against these time feeds. The first time thief that we have to grapple with is a a, a common menace. It's our best intentions that cause us to let this thief in even when we think we're guarding against it. And this thief, it takes many forms, so it's often not recognized until it's too late, and by then you've lost a great deal of your precious time. And the time thief I'm referring to is a whole myriad of interruptions and disruptions that nibble away at your time every single day. Sometimes these materialize as urgent seeming issues that require immediate attention. And there's a heightened sense of emotionality around these. And you feel compelled to don your superhero cape and fly in to save the day. More often though, your time, it dribbles away in a less dramatic fashion. It's a few minutes at a time, perhaps on one uh, quick question that someone asks or in a series of emails that chime in as they're arriving in your inbox. Or maybe for you, these are mental distractions with your mind racing throughout the day, juggling multiple demands, constantly on overload as you're multitasking. And if that's happening, 
it's not a people first approach because it doesn't make people feel like um, they're important, right? If all those interruptions and disruptions are interfering, well, then it makes people feel like an afterthought. Leaders have time and they make time for people. They're available. They're fully present when they interact with people. And they don't allow themselves to get pulled away by the onslaught of potential distractions. So let's face it. There will always be multiple things that you could focus on at any given time. That's a fact. It's not going to change. But you can't inspire and engage and ennoble people if they're constantly marginalized by whatever pops up. So to allocate your time as a people leader, you'll want to consider some of those obvious tactics, the ones you've heard before, like go ahead and do it, turn off your phone, and silence your email chime when you're meeting face-to-face with others. And that way you'll give people your undivided attention and you'll be more efficient. Your your meetings are going to go faster. And, and you'll be more effective as a leader. Not only that, but you'll, you'll want to get into a habit of honoring the meeting times that you set with people, knowing that they probably view that meeting with you, their manager, as one of the most important meetings they'll have all day. And it's a best practice to set specific times for when you are and also when you're not available for team members. And there are different ways you could do this, depending on on your workplace and your preference. Uh, Some strategies for doing this include conducting one-to-one meetings on a regular basis. Or you might want to post office hours or times when your door is wide open for people to stop by. And by the way, that's a controlled approach for, for the open door policy. It's one that gives you a way to also close your door, literally or metaphorically, at other times of the day. See, the the point isn't quantity of time when you're physically there in the office or in the workplace. What, What you ought to be aiming for is quality of time when you are truly present and focused and available. Now, I, I, I should probably make one clarification about availability. You should set boundaries about what you are and what you're not available for. So it's not just the time, but, but what's okay to talk about. Right? Set some expectations that people bring you ideas and solutions, not just problems. Communicate out that your time is not going to be spent on unproductive topics that you can't control and you can't influence. And then avoid the urge. To just don't indulge in conversations that are little more than and gripe and moan sessions. Those are pointless. They go nowhere. Avoid gossip. Don't get bogged down in those play-by-play recaps and those endless he said, she said conflicts. Just let people know that you're interested in hearing their solutions and their ideas and that you believe they can settle their differences on their own. Back it up by cutting short conversations that aren't future-focused. And when you can, be sure to do a little MBWA too. You know, that, that's management by walking around. It includes asking questions like, hey, what's new today? And how are things coming along? And, uh, you know, what do you need from me today? These are conversations that are unplanned. And it also gives you an opportunity, because it's outside of your office, gives you an opportunity to observe when things seem out of sorts gives you a chance for spontaneous recognitions and appreciations and encouragements too, which everybody needs when the going gets tough. So these are all, I know I'm I'm talking about the obvious first, but I'm going to keep taking this a little deeper as we go. So let's talk about another insidious little time thief. And let me start by asking you a question. Have you ever calculated the amount of time you spend in meetings each month. That's a lot of time for most people. According to to one study from Industry Week, middle managers spend an average 
of 12 hours per week in meetings. That's more than 25% of a, of a regular work week. That's 48 hours a month, which is more than a full week's worth of time every single month spent in meetings. And not only that, but an average manager also spends four hours per week preparing for meetings. So it adds up. That, that same study, it, it had one other interesting factoid, one finding. It concluded that over $37 billion, with a B, over $37 billion per year is lost as a result of unproductive meetings. And meetings are, sadly, they're often unproductive. Um, that's because most people in them are multitasking. They're not really focused on the meeting topics. And at a time when more people are, are being invited to more meetings, the relevance of what's being talked about in those meetings is at an all-time low for most people. So here's a radical idea that will save you time. Stop going to some meetings. Well, the hard part is deciding which ones not to go to. And, and frankly, it just boils down to this one thing. Is the information that you would receive important enough for you to take time in, to be in that meeting? Is there no other way for you to get that information? And an even more important criteria is the information you would provide, the insights that you would offer, are those essential or not? If your attendance at a meeting will not impact the outcome of the meeting, maybe you shouldn't be there. Maybe it's a meeting that shouldn't even be taking place at all. So be a little bit more demanding when it comes to meetings. They should earn your time and attendance. It shouldn't just be you got invited, so you went. Now let's also talk about the meetings that you create, the ones that you host. And what I've put up for you on screen there, it's, it's meant to be a guide. You can use this to answer questions like, well, should you call a meeting? Should you include an agenda item in an existing meeting? And those are valid questions. Asking them will help you to free up your time instead of just being swept up by the current. It will also help you to, to preserve and protect the time of your direct reports and others that you might be inviting to your meetings. Now, I, I'm, I'm just going to say this because I don't know who all is going to listen to this on demand, but um, one of the biggest barriers to doing what I'm describing is that you have to set aside your own ego to be effective in making these kinds of determinations. It's true that time spent with you is important, but group meetings aren't always the best venue for sharing what you need to share. They're certainly not the best venue for developing people. That's better done one-to-one. -one. And not only that, not every communication needs to be face-to-face -face and verbal. Not everything needs to be talked about with a full group. So these general guidelines are meant for you to, to be able to shave some minutes off your meetings to help you decide whether you can get some time back for developing and leading people. And as I said, for those of you who came in a little bit later, over in the attachments and links, I've, I've given you these slides. So you can just use this as your own personal checklist to decide whether or not to meet and whether or not to attend another meeting and whether or not to put something on the agenda. When you do meet with the staff that reports to you, here are some additional guidelines. You might want to set some ground rules for your meetings and then stick to them, create some discipline around them. These guidelines are the kinds of things that will help keep your meetings on track. They do demonstrate a people-first approach uh, and, and a respect for other people's time, and they Put your meetings on notice. You're putting the, everyone on notice who attends your meetings or contributes topics to them. It shows that your expectation is that meetings have a purpose. The purpose of a meeting is twofold. It's to inform people and it's to engage people. And when people know that, they're going to be better prepared for discussions you're going to get a better chance of a full focus from everybody attending. 
there's going to be less repetition, there's going to be uh, fewer missed opportunities, there, there will be more uh, ways that all voices can be heard when you're engaging people and when they know what to expect and when they know that your meetings are going to be high value. And when you have a time-bound and a topic-bound agenda, people can more likely retain and then act on whatever was discussed. If you're cramming too much, if you have more than, say, five topics, that's going to result in no change happening. Nothing can happen. Those meetings become completely unproductive because they put people into a state of mental overload. All right. Now, if you want more information about anything that we're talking about, please know that I'm skimming the surface uh, through one-to-one coaching through management training courses and in a variety of other ways, we can help you get a lot deeper. And you'll just reach out and connect with me if there's something more that you or your team need. But I do want to spend the majority of our time, the rest of our time, on the third strategy for getting more time into your schedule. And as I said at the beginning, this is the number one top strategy for building your team's capacity too. So you get a double benefit, you'll save time, and you'll be building people up. And it is delegating, of course it's delegating, which simply means giving an assignment to someone else or uh, getting a job done through someone else. It means entrusting both a task and an authority for that task to someone else. It's a word origin comes from Latin. It means to send from. And you'll notice the word I used once already, it's right here in the legal definition It's about entrusting someone else. They have to have the power. They have to have your trust. They have to know you believe in them in order for the delegation you're doing to be effective. You know, in business delegating, it's actually pretty simple and straightforward, but we tend to make it a little harder than it has to be, so that's why we're going to take time and break it down. First things first, I'd like to convince you that it's a good idea, and it is. Uh, There are many, many reasons for delegating, and they benefit you. They also benefit the people that you delegate to. And if you are thinking about delegation as I'm framing it, delegating for development, then you'll achieve both of those benefits. Effective delegation, good delegation, it is developing people who are ultimately more fulfilled and more productive and the managers doing the delegating, they too become more fulfilled and more productive as they learn to count on their staff people and they're freed up to attend to more strategic issues, the kinds of things that managers are supposed to be doing. Supervisors who can effectively delegate, they can free up a lot of their own time. And with that extra time, then they can help their direct reports. They they can cultivate expertise they can develop their own leadership skills too, skills that make them even better at problem solving, strategic thinking, goal attainment, learning, and and so much more. You know, delegating also does improve overall team effectiveness, morale, and engagement in the workplace. People are more motivated in environments where there's more delegating. So these benefits, they are huge, and they, they make it worthwhile to take another look at delegating. So I'm just going to pause. I'd love for you to give me this. Use the questions field. Tell me why it is that you don't delegate. With all those benefits, it begs the question, if delegating is so important and it has so many benefits, then why don't more people do it more often? Go ahead. Jot down your your answer for me. I, I I won't put your name next to it. I'm just curious to see of the people attending live today, what are some of the reasons that you don't delegate more often? I'm going to take a pause and wait for you to to input your response. Why don't you personally delegate more often? Okay, good. I'm getting a couple of answers here. Keep them coming. Why don't you personally, you, or if, if you work with a lot of other managers, if it's uh, something you're observing that others don't do, why is it? Why do you think they don't delegate more often? Ah, Yes, I'm hearing answers that I've sometimes heard before, uh, and I want to talk about every one of these. 
I'll go ahead and, and keep talking. Keep your answers coming in. We're getting a very good list here. And I'll give you these as well as some other ones that I frequently hear. Keep them coming. Um, these are valid, right? I, these are reasons. All those benefits aside, these are valid reasons. They include things like my staff are already overwhelmed with tasks. I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. Another one that's very similar coming in, frontline is already overworked and they're underpaid. I feel as someone who's higher paid, I should help with that problem. That's a, a caring thought. We're going to talk about that too. I just want to challenge the ways that we're looking at this. Um, here's someone who's not a manager saying, I think our managers don't delegate because they're perfectionists. Sometimes I hear things like managers are control freaks. Sometimes I hear managers don't trust me. They hoard the work. They're trying to have job security. Right? A lot of times there, there seem to be um, reasons why managers aren't willing to share with people who are perfectly capable of doing the work. I, I love this honest response. Somebody has written that they don't delegate because of ego, feeling that no one can do as good a job as, as I can do. And you're probably right. No one can do as good a job as you can do. Not today. Once upon a time, though, there was somebody who entrusted that work to you and gave you the opportunity to be as good as you are now. So we have to sometimes let go and find out what people could do. Um, let's see. They think others won't do it as well as they would. Uh, no one is going to do it the right way, which is, is their way, my way. That makes sense. These all make sense to me. Sometimes I also hear things like being stuck in a comfort zone. I like what I do. These are, this is my work. Or I don't have confidence in others' abilities. I feel my own stature will be diminished. I don't have time to teach somebody else how to do it. It's just easier to do it myself. And, and sometimes I also hear, well, I'd like to delegate. I, I just don't really know how. So I'm going to talk about all these reasons. But for now, whatever your reasons or reasons are, I'd like you to stack it up next to those proven benefits of delegating, these, the ones I talked about. And which would you rather have, the status quo with your reason not to delegate or these higher levels of engagement, people development, motivation, fulfillment, achievement, leadership that comes with delegating despite your reasons? It's just a choice. And if you want to make a choice, a choice to do more delegating. Let me help you think through it a little bit differently. I'm going to go to the extreme, to the absurd for just a minute. Please indulge me. Let me ask you this. What if no one ever delegated anything at all? What if your parents or your guardians had never delegated a single aspect of your care to anyone else? They didn't delegate the care of you to a babysitter or uh, an older sibling or a friend, a grandparent, a neighbor, some other relative, and they never, ever delegated any household chores to you, no dishes, no table setting, no bed making, no room cleaning, no taking out the trash. Instead, they picked up all the toys, and they never gave you any responsibilities for any work at all. Oh, and they didn't delegate your instruction or learning to any other teachers either. Right? Not in school, not in any setting. Everything you learned came directly from them. In fact, they didn't delegate role modeling for you to any other adults, nor did they rely on medical doctors or other professionals for your health care needs, and they were also your only playmates. They, they didn't want to burden any other children with your playtime needs. So just think. When you look at it this way, you've seen delegation modeled since you were a very young child. Just imagine what would be different about you if your parents had not delegated in all the ways I just listed. And the truth is, you would not be fully developed as a capable and functioning adult. Your parents would have limited you in many ways if you had been sheltered by them doing every single thing for you. And the same is true in the workplace when those with higher levels of responsibility don't delegate to others. And as absurd as that is, this example that I've given you, I've seen it. I've seen workplaces where the most well-intentioned, caring managers did things for other people 
in an effort to protect them and to make things easy for them and in full understanding that, that folks are just busy and already stressed. And yet it suppresses the ability of folks to develop. So here's, um, here's something else, a different way of looking at it. What I'm showing you here, this comes from Dr. Csikszentmihalyi at the University of Chicago, and you've probably heard it before. It's called getting in the flow or getting in the zone. When you're in the zone, we use that term, we use that to describe peak performance by athletes and by others who are at the, at the very top of their game. And here's the thing. What brings out the best in people is when they're in the flow zone, and that's represented here in this middle light pink bar, being in the flow is when the level of challenge over on the left vertical grid, when the level of challenge slightly exceeds your current level of skill. People are more motivated. They're more likely to be in the zone. They're at their peak performance when they are stretched just a little bit beyond their current capacity and skill. Not so much of a stretch that it's stressful. That's called the panic zone when you're up in the way up left corner there. That's when the challenge is much greater than your current skill or capacity. You don't want to put people in the panic zone. But you certainly don't want to leave them where most people are, which is over here in the right-hand lower corner, when their level of skill significantly exceeds the level of challenge. That's called the drone zone. That's not motivating. It's not stimulating. It's not where people learn and grow. And it's why they leave organizations quite often. They might say, there's too much work to do here. But what they're really saying is there's too much work here that's boring and unstimulating to me and nobody's giving me a chance to grow. That's really problematic when that happens. But that's precisely where most workers in the U.S. at least say that they are, is in the drone zone. And it's why good quality delegating for development makes for a happier workplace. And this is even true when people say, I'm maxed out, I have a lot to do. When they have opportunities that stimulate and engage them where someone trusts them and they can be stretched a little bit, suddenly they feel differently about that workload. So please keep that in mind. Now, what would this require? To, to do what I'm describing, to truly delegate for development, you need a little paradigm shift. You have to change the questions that you're asking and the habits that you have. Right? To, to, to delegate effectively, to stop doing the things you've always done, whatever your reasons were, you have to shift your way of thinking. The question that you need to ask is not, how will I go about doing this? The questions on screen are the replacement questions to ask instead. And if you want to take a really, really powerful takeaway from this webinar, it goes like this. It's an exercise. I highly recommend it. You have to time bound yourself. You spend only one hour on this task. The first 15 minutes are making a list of all of your recurring tasks and responsibilities. Just make a list of all the things you do over and over again. And then for each item that you've listed, you have to answer at least one of these questions that are on screen. And with that, you'll then begin to have some thoughts about what to delegate and who you might delegate it to. Now, I do want to go ahead and, and uh, tell you what not to do as you're delegating. There are certain things that should not be delegated, not even to HR. You don't want to delegate the things that are about the people on your team. You can absolutely, and you should absolutely, involve HR in delicate decisions related to personnel. But don't bow out. Stay involved. And once you've delegated something, don't do it like a fire hose. Do it incrementally in little steps so that people are able to acquire the task and the capacity for doing it and trust it to them. Know that they are not going to do it as well as you. It's going to take time for them to learn. You might want to give them space for uh, finding their own ways to do things. Maybe they will ultimately find something that you never thought of doing. But don't take it back. Give them time. Help them. Support them. Delegate to the people who are receptive, who will communicate to you when they are finding it to be overwhelming, when you see potential in them. 
when they are not quite already ready to do this task, but could be ready with the right oversight and, and coaching, knowing that you believe in them. And do this kind of delegating on a regular basis, not just all at once, but a little bit at a time. And when you do it, be very clear, be complete, be transparent about why you're delegating. Give appreciation and encouragement to people. Give them that trust. That may be the hardest part for some. But you, uh, you ultimately have to trust people. You won't always be there in the job that you're in today. If you are a leader, you're helping others to do your job so that you can continue to do higher level work and that you can show how you can expand the capacity for your organization. Not trusting people, not delegating because you don't trust them, is a surefire way to alienate people, lose their engagement, have low motivation in the workforce, and find yourself at an impasse where you can never change your reputation once it's been sullied because you're not a people builder. So be very careful. Developing people, delegating, they're both super important. Now, this is just a little reminder. I think I've said most of these things, but um, perhaps they're a little starker here. I'd like to encourage you to take the infographic that I put in the attachments and links because it also includes what we've talked about plus more, like the eight essential steps of delegating. And I've given you a, a website page, too, where I've got some articles that go into more detail uh, and um, some information that will help you to get started, no matter what it is that's holding you back from delegating. But ultimately, back to where we started, this is all about your time and how you allocate your time and how you use your time to be more and more effective as a manager because, frankly, that's what people are counting on you for. And whether it's time management or delegating or any of the other types of things that, that managers uh, do, every single one of them having an impact on the time that you spend, well, we've got some resources for you. I, I'd encourage you to, to subscribe to our community where you'll get a weekly newsletter with lots of tips and techniques. Um, I put some ebooks there for you that you can link to in the attachments. I'd certainly be happy to work with you as a speaker for your team or a trainer, a one-to-one -one coach. You've just gotten some ideas. This is the starting point. Don't walk away and let it be the end point. There's so much that you could do that will make you more effective as a manager. And it always starts with putting people first. That's what we specialize in here at People First Productivity Solutions. I appreciate your time and attention today. I think I've gotten all the questions that have been asked so far. I will pause and give you a last chance. Any additional questions that you have for me for those who are attending live today? As I said, I will always answer those one-to-one -one via email if you post something later. Or if you're someone who's listening on demand, uh, I'll come back to you with those questions and you're welcome to contact me too. I'm Deb Calvert. Thank you very much for your time today. Don't forget to leave me a review.